I'm going to address some of the general themes that we talked about before lunch, uh, using some concepts from Marx, but I hope taking them in some unusual and perhaps even un-Marxian directions. So my main suggestion here is that by looking at the history and geography of precarious work, we can observe and critique the combined and uneven structure of capitalism today. Or perhaps my claim is even stronger than this, that uh, precariousness and precarious work are privileged sites from which to perform this kind of structural observation. So I want to ask three questions and provide just quick partial answers to these three. One, where did precarious work come from? Two, how does precarious work look in different places in Europe? And three, what kinds of analytical distinctions must be accounted for if we're to understand precarious work as a single term, and perhaps ultimately as its own class, the precariat? So first, a few language points. I understand precarious work as a loose concept that covers the life experience of a vast number of Europeans. It's visible across sectors and is most commonly used to refer to individuals who perform labour without the long-term contracts and social security benefits that characterise much 20th century employment. At an official EU level, this is usually meant those who work part-time, who are underemployed or who are performing temporary work. It is often linked to outsourced roles in, private service, in the private service sector, but is increasingly characteristic too of state employment. Perhaps more controversially, those who undertake precarious work could be understood as, understood as belonging to a wider group or class, sometimes called the precariat. This group is much wider than the definition employed by officials at an EU or nation state level. In addition to the previous labour arrangements, it also includes the unemployed, those on unpaid internships and those who are made redundant. Finally, and crucially, it also includes the numerous groups who do not have any labour rights, such as migrants with limited or no documentation. So what are the distinctive features of precariousness, and from where do they arise? I think it's important to be clear from the offset that work has always, to a certain extent, been precarious. In the industrial era of capitalism, for example, predominantly male workers were often required to move between professions, factories or towns without advanced warning. Their lives were always determined primarily by the market and not by democratic government, the will of the state or their own representative bodies, which some historians still continue to argue. The development of the labour movement, with its commitment to providing social security, its contestation for fair wages, developed in order to challenge this force and temper the more violent excesses caused by competition. Precarity, then, is the result of a system of economic logic that pri prior prioritises competition beyond all other forms of relation. We usually just call this capitalism. I would go as far as to suggest here, however, that the development of trade unions might usefully be seen in these terms as a process by which a 19th century precariat, or perhaps proto-precariat, became proletariat. I'll get to this later to clarify. What has changed, though, since 100 or even 40 years ago? I would suggest that the politicisation of precarity is key to understanding this. Flexibility, choice, and most importantly, entrepreneurialism remained the key words employed by the political class across Europe today to describe contemporary work. This is not a small point, but a key component in today's power structure, an echo of the Thatcher-Reagan years. And these, de these years were indeed formative for the precariat, the time of its birth or rebirth. In the 1970s in Britain, France and Italy in particular, the labour movement was in a strong position. Strikes were widespread and demands were being articulated for real control over the workplace, the economy and democratic structures. This, of course, posed a real threat to the political and economic strategy of neoliberalism, which was beginning to take shape at this time. At the same time, technological revolutions in production enabled manufacturing to be outsourced to Asia and South America, and developed economies began to centre themselves increasingly around communication, finance and information labour. This shift from the production of goods to services, a shift which brought a lot of short-term wealth to a certain class, enabled the political class to reinforce their own power and to dismantle the bargaining power of the unions in one fell swoop. And this was largely successful. 
Today, fewer and fewer people belong to unions. But of course, this is not because we have all but suddenly become bankers. On the contrary, in this space is the precariat. Today, more and more people are now forced to change rapidly between a number of different positions. One week a bartender, the next a supermarket clerk, then a call centre worker, then unemployed. Where once the working class movement was in a place to resist in the interests of class and had some agency to do so, now union power is limited to, or perhaps it limits itself to, struggles over wages determined by capital which for obvious reasons does not appeal to those who are never in the workplace for long enough to form communities of resistance. More gravely, I think we must face up to a tacit economic and social fact. Where precarity was once a condition deemed undesirable, something to be overcome, it is rapidly becoming the new normal, an organizing principle of work itself, rather than a dialectical counterpoint. When neoliberal politicians face their critics they shrug them off by talking about the barbarism of the industrial past. Stifling old factory work, mainly performed by men, is over. Thank God, we should all be thankful. And in a sense, this is correct. And it's problematic to valorise this kind of alienating work, and many portions of the left do still do this. On the other hand, however, one of the most important ideas at the core of the response to the crisis is the popular realisation that so-called flexibility of labour does not provide greater ownership, dignity and autonomy, but generates anxiety, poverty and social exclusion. To get beyond this, however, the precariat cannot fall back on an outdated model of the Keynesian state coupled with protectionist manufacturing. A broader conversation is required about what kind of work we all want to do and how a new model of production might be reorganised. So I think the question arises in relation to this as to where is precarious work today? In line with the historical origins I've just outlined, which I think should be summarised as representing a phase within globalisation, precarious work is now widespread in all European countries. Despite this, we should not be seduced into thinking about the term merely in the abstract. National and territorialised factors remain central to understanding how this form of work generates an experience of life itself as being precarious. Particularly when we talk about Europe, we must stay alert to the danger of making generalised statements about the continent as a whole. Precarious work, and by extension the precariat, looks very different in Germany, for example, than in Spain or Italy. The following three examples serve to demonstrate this diversity, while at the same time I hope will reinforce the historical narrative, albeit a quick one that I've just sketched out. So first, Germany. The German model is talked of with reverence in the EU, and is one of the main examples that neoliberal governments have sought to replicate across the continent. Precarious work is a major part of this, which is an important fact that is often overlooked by those focusing on macro and geopolitical critiques. No. Germany has a precariat. This is manifest particularly in the example of mini jobs, a highly organized part-time work scheme encouraged by the German state. Those who take such jobs might work 20 hours a week on one or more of these initiatives and earn approximately 400 euros a month. There are now over 7.3 million people living solely on this income. Relatively good working conditions and benefits cheap transport, ample social housing, have disguised the forms of class exploitation that are taking root in the country. The German union Verdi, for example, has been documenting a trend by which full-time workers at companies are made to leave their positions and reapply for the same jobs but as temporary workers. This is particularly grave, as other studies have shown that such positions offer no possibility of mobility, even into other low-skilled employment. While many jobs might be enough to get by in the short term and certainly offer more security for the precariat than in other places in Europe. The price is high. Once you take a mini job, it is unlikely you will move to something more permanent. So my second example is from the UK. Like Germany, the UK is often presented particularly by its political class as being home to a functioning and healthy economy. In fact, precarity is creating serious poverty traps that affect the vast majority. An extreme example, I think, serves to highlight a more general trend. The proliferation of zero-hour contracts has inaugurated a new form of workplace domination that is largely absent from public, public conversation and I think merits an extensive analysis in its own right elsewhere. Those working on zero-hour contracts 
are not guaranteed any work by their employer. The potential employee must wait constantly on call for a job that may never come. This leads to a double bind. Very often the employee or apparent employee is left without a salary, but so too without the right to claim benefits or job seekers allowance. They are allowed to fall into poverty, or more specifically, are forced into poverty. Sadly, this kind of work is no longer a marginal phenomenon, but is increasingly widespread. According to 2011 data, 19% of British catering staff were working zero hours, along with 13% of health sector workers and 10% of education workers. Unlike in Germany, in the majority of cases, those who earn by such means do not make enough money to live. Many of the young people coming from abroad to find such jobs then, such as the young Greeks, Italians, and Spanish people that are coming to London, will find themselves in these kinds of arrangements without any guarantee of a salary. While the UK positions itself as an entrepreneurial society and is widely thought of as an employment haven, it cannot match the offers of German mini-jobs as living costs are simply too high. My final example here then, by way of contrast, is from Italy where I live and where in fact the precariat was first born as a term. The Italian case demonstrates the danger of attempting to emulate the German model in a society that is even less fit than Britain for such an arrangement. While unemployment is not as high here as Greece and Spain, there are several factors that make the Italian case stand out. Since the 90s, productivity has declined from 1.65% to 0.39% alongside massive stagnation. This is clearly the fault of institutional inefficiency and corruption. It is not, as the old neoliberal mantra would have it, the fault of the unions. In fact, a recent study by the OECD showed that Italy already has the most flexible labour market in the world. Italy, then, is a country that already has an abundance of precarious jobs. But it could hardly be considered a German-style utopia. Nonetheless, with Germany in mind, the solution of new left-wing premier Matteo Renzi is to make the country more flexible through a series of measures packaged together as a jobs act. The plan includes a reform of the constitution designed to give more rights to employers. In real terms, this would mean that bosses would be able to fire workers who've been on the payroll for three years without any explanation. The companies with more than 15 employees would no longer have to go through the courts before firing, and in larger terms, that every single job would be split into effectively three mini-jobs. Unemployment figures would drop, but nobody would be able to afford to save for the future. This is the key point, however. Previous attempts to create a more productive precarity, embodied by the Biagi and Fornero laws, have only exacerbated the nation's problems. And yet, the neoliberal mantra goes on against all evidence. The idea that the German strategy can be applied to Italy is frankly absurd. Flexibility requires a strong and efficient welfare system, adequate housing, and perhaps ultimately even a basic income, something I hope we'll talk about later on. These are all arguments being made by grassroots groups, but they have not yet made it into policy discussions. I could go on. There are versions of these stories to be told in Portugal, in France, and of course here in Spain. The state of precarity across Europe is geographically uneven, and yet unified by a neoliberal politics which willfully and consciously stifles social mobility and perpetuates inequality. This is its raison d'etre. In this context, precarity as an analytical concept illustrates the continued importance of thinking about capitalism as a combined and uneven system against postmodern proclamations about the end of history. I would contend, moreover, that it's imperative to think these problems through a European lens if a solution is to be found. Here I've tried to give a brief outline of the kinds of comparisons we need to make if a new class perspective is to develop. The precariat in Germany can live and cobble together the basics for life, but they shouldn't have to sacrifice their futures in doing so. In Britain, the precariat cannot afford to live in the cities where it is able to find work, and must confront its expendability on a daily basis in constant fear of poverty. In Italy, the precariat is at the centre of an intense constitutional conflict and looks set to explode thanks to a top-down reform by a nominally left-wing government. 
Members of the precariat have been at the forefront of new democratic movements challenging state and corporate power. Podemos in Spain, Occupy in UK, the Plenums in Bosnia. But their voices are still not being heard by those in power. The precariat has not yet established itself as a class in itself capable of articulating demands and fighting for their realisation. I want to end then on a question. Where are the unions in all this? They're talking about pay and pensions for those already belonging to the labour movement. They go down to the piazza with banners and placards and shout anti-austerity messages. The precariat, however, is alienated from these movements. It does not value the welfare state because it gets nothing from it. And it does not identify with old communist and laborist symbols because it has no sense of occupational identity. Earlier on, I suggested that it was conditions of precarity that first necessitated the formation of workers' bodies, like unions. The new precariat, now far removed from the old labor movement, must organize on its own terms in dialogue across borders. It must influence the union discussion, build links with it, but at the same time, go beyond it. Most importantly, as I've attempted to show here, such a conversation cannot limit itself to orthodox economics, but must work to redefine this discipline in tandem with a new politics. Thank you very much.